Do you know why I have this microphone? Because uh, I want to record this course and I will upload uh, the video file to the homepage of JFT for you to study um, by yourself and uh, the video clip will be helpful for your uh, self-study. Okay? So please, when you sleep during the course, it may be recorded, so <laughs> please be careful. Okay, I would like to check the attendance. Kimizu? Jogihun? Kimdukjung? Bangdaku? Yujun? Shubang? Alkan? Kim Jongin? Chawansa? Kim Sawan? Song Yunze? Fan? Not you. Fan and two. Not here. Dong? Taman? Kwonsa? Okay, shall we start? Uh, today I would like to briefly introduce the short history of the phase transformation, the study on the phase transformation, and then I would like to move the, some basic property of this pure ion, and I will move to the uh, important things, issues on the interstitial uh, solid solution which is related to behavior of the carbon in the pure ion. This is the, what is this? This is the world first ion bridge built in United Kingdom. And it was built at 1779, around 30, two, two and a half hundred, hundred years ago. Of course, there has been several repairing, but it is still used. And you can see the people on, on the bridge, and you can understand it is uh, quite still stable and safe. One of the most interesting thing is that this steel bridge was built without any knowledge on the microstructure of the steel. Actually, the first observation of the steel microstructure was conducted at 1864, which is about 100 years later, after the building of world first iron bridge. As you can see, the most of the important observation or understanding of the phase transformation and microstructural evolution, related microstructural evolution, was done about from the uh, late uh, 18th to 1960s is about 100 years span. So most of the important development was done within this short period. Considering that when the period of the usage of iron in human beings' history is around how, how long? 
Sorry? Yeah, about 3,000 years. Human has used the iron and steel for 3,000 years. But it is very interesting to see that the most of the research on the microstructure of the steel was performed in only for 100 years. So when we consider the, when we compare this one to the classic subject such as physical, physics or chemi chemistry, the phase transformation, the subject itself is quite newborn area. I've copied this statement from the website and I was very, how can I say, interesting to see. This statement was done by Sir Solvi, who was the UK scientist who firstly observed the microstructure of the steel. He wrote like this, in those early days, if railway accident had occurred and I have suggested that the company should take up the rail and have it examined with the microscope, then I should have been looked upon as a fit man to send to an asylum. What does it mean? When the, some accident or failure occurs, the observation of the microstructure of the structure is a kind of typical way to investigate how those kind of failure occurs. But at that day, it was a nonsense to see the microstructure. Actually, they do not know about there is such kind of structure inside of steel. So that's why he said like this. What is the definition of the phase transformation, which is main subject of this lecture? What is the definition of the phase transformation, in particular in solid state? The definition of the phase transformation in solid state is change of atomic array in material according to the change in temperature, pressure, stress, and electromagnetic field. In other words, the phase transformation in solid state is rearrangement of atomic array in response to the external field. You know that the temperature, pressure, and stress is a kind of external field which exerted on the material. You know that for the starting or pro proceeding of the page transformation, some driving force is required. For example, when I drop this fan from here, it will fall into the floor. So what makes this fan drop? Gravity. Yeah, in other words, the potential energy of this position and the ground position. The difference of potential energy will make this pen drop. So those kind of difference in potential energy will be a driving force of uh, this phenomenon. In phase transformation, there is two kind of driving force. One from the difference of the free energy, which comes from the structure of the material or the chemical composition. 
those kind of driving force is called the chemical driving force and this chemical driving force is an important driving force for the uh, phase transformation like precipitation or you take fluid direction or cellular transformation and other uh, important uh, diffusion or transformation. On the other end, there is a, another driving force which drive the transformation. For example, when you deform the material and heat it up, then new grain, which is free from the dislocation, forms and grow. In that case, the crystal structure or chemical composition in deformed grain and newly formed grain is almost similar. Actually, it is equal, the same. So in that case, what kind of driving force act? Sorry? Internal, internal stress, maybe. And diffusion. diffusion. If actually, diffusion is a kind of process rather than the uh, driving force. This will be, as you can say, an internally accumulated strain energy. When you compare the strain energy of deformed crystal and undeformed one, it is obvious that the strain energy in deformed crystal is higher than the undeformed one. So in this case, the accumulate strain energy inside of the crystal will be the driving force for the recrystallization and also the grain grows. When the grain starts growth, what makes it grow? By growing the size, what kind of benefit the material have? Right. When crystal grow, the overall surface inside of crystal will reduce. And those kind of reduction in interface energy dry the grain growth. So in this case, the decrease in the interfacial energy causes the grain growth. So even though most of the uh, phase transformation in solid state occurred by the chemical driving force, but sometimes for example, recrystallization or grain growth, the driving force is not related to the chemical one and it, it is uh, rather uh, related to the uh, strain energy or surface energy uh, inside of the material. Actually, the phase transformation can be classified into these two kind of two kind of one. One is homogeneous transformation, and the other is heterogeneous transformation. The difference between the homogeneous and heterogeneous transformation is that in homogeneous phase transformation, whole body of the material participate the progress of the transformation. And the representative one is spinodal decomposition. We will handle in later class. And most of the transformation you can observe in iron and steel is heterogeneous transformation. Heterogeneous transformation is, as it says, transformation start at at first at localized portion. What do you call those kind of localized portion at the beginning 
of the transformation. Nucleus, right? That is nucleus. So you can say in the progress of heterogeneous transformation, it starts with the nucleation and growth. So any transformation which is related with nucleation and growth is heterogeneous transformation. Okay? So many transformations, for example, Martin City or protectoid ferrite or polite transformation, all, all those transformations you can see in ferrous material is heterogeneous transformation. We can see the difference of the homogeneous and heterogeneous transformation in terms of the profile of the driving force. These two states represent two metastable equilibrium states without any, without any external disturb. These two ball will stay its original position. But with some disturbance, eventually this ball will go to this position and this ball will go to this position. What makes the difference between these two events? These two events the driving force will be the difference, height difference in these two positions and this one in these two positions. And what what is the difference? Exactly. When you look at this position, even though this is a metastable equilibrium position, very, very small disturbance will start the movement of the ball, which means the will start the, the transformation. In other words, for the progress of this kind of transformation, there will be no activation energy for the process of the transformation. On the other hand, when you look at this figure, to move this ball to this position, you have to get over this amount of height, which can be called activation energy. Activation energy is the least energy which required to initiate the transformation. So in this case, this amount of activation energy is required and eventually very localized part of the material which can get over this energy barrier by thermal fluctuation or accidental aggregation of the atom can form a nucleus and growth of those kind of nucleus will govern the progress of the transformation. So naturally you can see that in homogeneous transformation, there is no energy barrier, activation energy barrier. So any part of the material can participate the transformation. That's why there is no requirement of the nucleation process. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, let's move to our main concern, the pure ion. ion. This is the diagram of the pure ion as a function of pressure and temperature. So there is four Roman uh, Greek character, Greek character alpha, delta, gamma, and epsilon. So which represent the crystal structures of the pure ion. And you can, you all know, may know, the crystal structure of alpha and delta ion is the similar, actually the same. And the crystal structure is body-centered cubic. As you can see here, and in body-centered cubic crystal, one atom in the center of the cube and four atoms at the corner. What will be the pressure of the normal atmosphere in terms of the bar? Normal atmosphere, what is, how much is the normal atmosphere in bar? 100. One hundred thousand. It's too much. About one bar. One bar is normal atmosphere, right? So, is it correct? One ATM is one zero one three millibar. So but one point zero one three bar is one atmosphere, right? Please check it. So when you consider the one bar is normal atmosphere, so uh, Crystal structure, when you look at the pure ion, it, at room temperatures, it should be the up ion, right? So when you increase the temperatures, the up ion will transform to gamma ion, which has face-centered cubic crystal. So as you can see in this figure, in face-centered cubic, there is Sorry? There is six atom at each face and eight atom at the corner. All right? So when you increase the temperature further, it will transform to PCC ion again. How about when we increase the pressure at the room temperature? Then up ion will transform to epsilon ion. And the crystal structure of epsilon ion is ACP, HCP structure, as you can see here. And I have to mention that both of FCC and HCP structure is closed packed structure in uh, crystal structures. But the difference is the, what is the difference between the HCP and this ion? FCC structure, right? The stacking sequence of the closed factor plane. For example, here in HCP material, closed factor plane is here. So the stacking sequence is A, B, and again A. But when you look at the stacking sequence of the closed factor plane in FCC, the closed factor plane in FCC is here. 111 plane. So when you look at the stacking sequence of the 111 plane, it's A, B, C, A, B, C. So stacking sequence is different. Anyway, when you increase the pressure at room temperatures, what you can obtain at very highest pressure is ACP ion. Okay? 
what is the most what kind of the crystal structure is most abundant earth sorry there is only three crystal structure hcp in iron hc bcc and fcc what is the most abundant form in earth BCC, FCC, HCP. Actually, the most abundant form is HCP. Because when you consider, when you think about the structure of the Earth, this is surface, and there is which is called core of the earth, which is the core of earth is a mixture of nickel and iron. And at this core, the pressure is very, very high. So it is not, even though it is not confirmed, many scientists believe that the form of iron in the core of the Earth will be HCP, right? Right. Once people use the beta iron, because they believe the beta iron is exist, but that is not true. The reason why people think about the bat iron is that the magnetic transition. Usually, there is a magnetic transition around 700 degrees Celsius. I will tell about this later, in a few slides later. There is a magnetic transition around 700 degrees Celsius. So people think that the crystal structure of the iron will, will change at that boundary. So people think about that around 700 to here is beta iron. But later, people realized that that is a kind of magnetic ordering and not related to the crystal structure. So that's why they remove the terms beta iron. Okay. Any other question? You may learn about the rules of Chatelier's principle in the chemical class in the high school. So it says that the equilibrium will shift to accommodate the environmentally uh, exerted for example, when we increase the temperatures, the equilibrium state will prefer to more open structures. When we decrease the temperatures, the stable state will be more denser state. With this principle, iron, the behavior of iron is quite strange because When we decrease the temperatures, the stable state crystal structure is up iron. And as you know, it is more open structure than the gamma iron. So in terms of Le, Le Chatelier's principle, it is quite strange. But now people know This strange behavior of the iron comes from the magnetic ordering around 
700 degrees Celsius. This is the thermal heat capacity of iron. And as you know, there are three contributions of heat capacity. One is reticle vibration, and second is electron movement, and the third is magnetic ordering. Usually, when the material do not have magnetic property, the most convincing effect comes from the reticle vibration. But in iron, there is a magnetic transition from ferromagnetic to para paramagnetic around 700 degrees Celsius. And this magnetic ordering have very strong influence on the heat capacity of iron. And as you know, the heat capacity governs almost every thermodynamic some dynamic property, right? It is related to the entropy, also it is related to the entropy. So this kind of characteristic behavior in terms of heat capacity result in the strange behavior of ion, for example, stable open structure at lower temperatures. So this is overall the capacity calculated with the thermal calc, uh, considering all of this one. And it, as you can see, there is some abnormal peak, which comes from the magnetic ordering around 700 degrees Celsius. When you consider this kind of uh, characteristic feature of heat capacity, we can draw the free energy of VCC ion and FCC ion as a function of temperature. As you can see here, the free energy of alpha ion is lower than the gamma ion at lower temperature, which means that VCC is more a stable pace. When we ignore the magnetic ordering, then the stable pace in iron at room temperature will be FCC. So due to the effect of magnetic contribution, you can see the upper iron as a stable pace at room temperature. It is clear when we consider the difference between the difference of the free energy between these two, two phase. And as you can see, there is a, some temperature region which correspond to the <coughs> austenite stable temperatures where the free energy of free energy of austenite is lower than the free energy of the ferrite, which means the austenite is a stable phase at that temperature region. Okay, and once again, if there is no contribution from the magnetic ordering, this curve will continuously increase like this, and the uh, austenite will be the stable phase at room temperature. Okay. Because alpha ion is more open structure than gamma ion, there is a discontinuity when we measure the density or the atomic volume of ion. The discontinuity occurs when the transformation occurs because the crystal structure is, is changing. So with this characteristic behavior, we can investigate 
the page transformation behavior of ion by measuring its density change, or in other words, volume change as we increase the temperature or decrease the temperatures. Because the, in terms of the length change, it shows very uh, characteristic behavior when the transformation occurs. And those characteristic behavior comes from the difference in the density. This is an example. It is difficult to see, so I can I will redraw the figure. When we measure the last change of the specimen as heated as hit the specimen, we usually have this kind of length change. And there is uh, some uh, uh, equipment which can measure the length change during the heating, which is called the dilatometer. And dilatometer is a very common facility to investigate the progress of page transformation in iron and steel. So when you hit the specimen, its length will increase because of the thermal expansion. And when gamma ions start to form, then it will reduce the density. So the length of the specimen start to deviate from its original character of ferrite. And when the transformation complete, it will follow the thermal expansion characteristic of austenite. So by analyzing the curve between these two lines, you can obtain how much of austenite is formed. during heating. Okay? So this comes from the assumption then the volume change when the volume change is very small, the length change will be one third of the volume change. And when you look at this figure, this black, red, green and blue Right, correspond to the increase of heating rate. So as you can see, the, when you increase the of heating rate, the formation temperature of austenite is gradually increased. Right? So by analyzing this curve, you can obtain this kind of transformation kinetics. One thing is very interesting is that when you compare the thermal expansion behavior of austenite, this line does not fall into one line. In other words, When this, let's assume, let's see, this is the thermal expansion behavior of ferrite, and this will be thermal expansion behavior of the austenite. Then, as temperature increase, and at certain temperature, the transformation will occur, then the thermal expansion behavior will deviate from it. 
right? And it, when the temperature, uh, when the transformation is complete, it will lie on the thermal expanding behavior of austenite, right? So when we increase, let's, let's assume when we increase the temperature uh, heating rate and the transformation occurs at slightly low, higher temperature region, then it will start, let's see, around here, then we'll go on the same line. But in real case, this line, this line does not fall into one line. What does it mean? Usually when we analyze the dilatation curve, there are two assumptions. One is the volume change is very small. And the other is the volume change occur isotropically. Which means that when initial shape of ferrite is this pier, then we assume that the resultant austenite will also have a sphere, which means that volume change occurs isotropically. But this kind of uh, experimental result indicate that the volume change usually is not isotropic, which means that when we transform this spherical shape of ferrite into austenite, then the shape of austenite is, for example, this kind of skewed shape. Ideally, the sphere ferrite should transform into the sphere austenite, but in many cases, the experimental limitation, for example, non-uniform distribution of the temperatures or some banded structure, which means the banded chemicals. When you, when you use, for example, there are some banded region, chemical region inside of the specimen, this region tend to transform preferentially while transform in, into austenite later. So those kind of, this kind of bandit structure can cause some stress field inside of the specimen. So that might cause this kind of uh, non-uniform transformation, non-uniform volume change during the transformation. Any question? Yeah. So, uh, the superheat affect the result? I mean, when we hit in a different acceleration, hitting different, this may change the curve. Right. There are several reasons why the hitting rate affect the dilatation behavior because when we adopt very slow hitting rate, the, the temperature distribution inside the inside of the specimen is very uniform. So it may not cause any stress field, thermal stress field or something like that. But when we hit the specimen in very high heating rate, 
the temperature distribution inside of the material is not may not uniform. So those kind of uneven distribution of temperature can cause thermal stress, which can affect affect the uh, the volume change, the anisotropic volume change during the transformation. That is uh, particularly related with the phenomena which is called transformation plasticity. That is not the trip. Trip is transformation induced plasticity and that kind of phenomena is when we have some residual, uh, residual austenite inside of the material, it gradually transformed into martensite during deformation. That is trip, but transformation plasticity means that when very small stress applied in the specimen during, during the transformation, it can cause anisotropic volume change. So when we, for example, this is our specimen and we put some very small compressive stress during heating. And let's see that this stress is lower than the yield stress of the material. So without transformation, nothing happened. But when the transformation occurs, this very small, very small stress can bias the volume changing. So without this stress, the volume changing should occur like this, without stress. But with the stress, if the stress exists, then the volume change occurs like this. So even though the stress level is very lower than the yield stress of the material, it can cause some apparent plasticity by biasing the volume change. So that, that is called transformation plasticity, which is different from the trip effect. Okay? Okay, I will stop here and continue in next class. Any other question? No? Okay, see you in next Tuesday.
질문 있으면 한글로 물어봐도 됩니다. <웃음> 그리고 어차피 이렇게 yeah. One thing I have to mention about it that, uh, that We are not non-native speakers So uh, it is common to make mistake when we speak English Because you know that about 80% of people communicate in broken English <laughs> So not worry about it. Even me, I'm not good at speaking English, but I'm less English. 